Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives, our jobs, our incomes, our debts, those looming down the road and those confronting our children as they stare at an economy that must give them sleepless nights. I'm your host, Richard Wolff. I've been a professor of economics all my adult life, and currently I teach at the New School University in New York City. Before jumping into today's program, which I think you will find exceptionally interesting, I wanted to mention that we are now available in video form. In other words, you may be listening to this program, but others may prefer, or even you may prefer, to watch it as a television program, as a video program. And so I want to tell you, because we're proud of it, that we are now available in that format. Uh, and I want to give you the two websites where you can go and see us that way, if you wish. The first is Patreon.com. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Patreon.com slash economic update. That's economic update as one word. That website will give you the video version of this program. And of course, the other place to go is the inimitable YouTube, where you can likewise find this program in video form if you are interested. As well as always, I need to remind you that we have two websites that we also maintain directly, where we add material that extends and expands on what we do on this program. Uh, that provide you with ways to communicate your pleasures and displeasures with this program to us, provide you ways to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on, and finally, allow you to partner with us in terms of helping us find new radio or television stations that might be interested in the program, and to perhaps arrange for a visit where I can come out and meet some of you, which I enjoy doing a great deal. These two websites are Democracy at Work, that's all one word, democracyatwork.info, I-N-F-O. And finally, the other website is rdwolf, with two Fs, dot com. Okay, let's jump into our economic updates uh, for today. And i starting with the state of Oklahoma. Why? Well, Oklahoma is a leader, if that's the term you can describe for something you wouldn't want to be a leader of, it's a leader in destroying, there's really no nice way to say this, it's public schools. Uh, let me give you an idea of the dimensions of this. There's been no increase, I'll start with, uh, with the statistics that I find the most amazing. Uh, Oklahoma has not raised teachers' salaries since 2008. Okay, uh, that's nearly a decade in which prices rose every year, but the salaries of those teachers did not. Oklahoma ranks 49th in the nation. We have 50 states, let's remember. 49th in the average salary of its teachers. Teachers are leaving the state in droves for better paying jobs across the state line. And the number of positions filled by what are called, and you've got to love this term, emergency-certified teachers. Emergency-certified teachers. These are people who have no education training. Mm. They are now 35 times as high in their use in Oklahoma schools as they were as recently as 2011. But I'm just beginning to tell you what years of Republican domination of the governors and the state legislature and what has happened in the rest of the United States, what it has done to the public schools of Oklahoma. They now lead the country in the number of schools that have gone from a five-day school week to a four-day school week. Over 20% of the 
of the school public schools in Oklahoma are now on a four day a week schedule. Why are they doing this? The answer is very clear and there's no one hiding it. They don't have any money. And they can save money this way. And when I inquired, how exactly do you save money since you're paying the teacher the same? The teachers get paid the same. We learned that since 2008, the teachers are paid the same. Well, you don't have to heat the building on Friday. You don't have to feed the children, at least that portion of the children that qualify for food assistance. And so you can save money by keeping the kids out of the school building. That seems to be the biggest saving. So take, let's take a look at that. If you have teachers that are increasingly unqualified, if you have a shorter length of the work week, what is happening to the kids? What is happening to their education? And what is happening to their families? Well, let's see. The poorer you are, the more you rely for your children's meals on breakfast and lunch at school. If you go from five to four days, that's one more day that your kids don't get breakfast or lunch at school. It's also four days when they are required to stay longer than the regular number of hours, and that puts an extra strain. If you are poor with both fam members, uh, adults in the household working, what are you going to do with your children on Friday? There isn't daycare, and even if there were, you can't afford it. To try to deal with this, Oklahoma offers daycare, at least in some of these schools where they've cut it to four days, and they charge $30 a day for the kids to come to school and do nothing. Whereas before they came to school and did their schoolwork. So it costs parents more to have the kid in school on Friday. It's just they don't get any teaching done. You got to scratch your head in stunned disbelief that this is called public education anymore. When I looked into it further, I discovered that one of the great benefits that the folks in Oklahoma described to me was that um, it's easier to recruit teachers which you can understand is difficult for Oklahoma if you rank 49th out of 50 as being the second lowest paying state in the union for public school teachers. We can get teachers now because we offer them a very low salary, but only four days a week that they have to be in school. And so they can have presumably other jobs to make up for the low salary, something that'll have them focused elsewhere, low on energy, depleted, who knows. In Oklahoma, elementary class sizes now hover between 26 and 27. Try to have a first grade class with one teacher and 26 or 27. It's far higher than the 20 student limit set in a 1990 Oklahoma state law, which apparently is simply ignored. In 2016, schools started charging to participate in sports and extracurricular activities. Let me say that again. Your child wants to learn a musical instrument and play in the school band. Your child wants to be on a sports team. You have to pay extra as a citizen. And why did all this happen? Because Oklahoma believes, like many states with Republican governments, that their number one priority is to cut taxes. And if you cut taxes, you see, you're supposed to believe everything gets better. The economy zooms, jobs appear out of nowhere, and everybody's better off. 
But if you talk to the students and the parents and the teachers, you will find a huge number of them understand that they're the fall guys. They're the victims of this policy. And now let me weigh in as an economist. By the way, before I do, let me give credit where it's due. The story of Oklahoma schools can be found in the Washington Post, dated May 27th, in a really fine, detailed article by Emma Brown. Washington Post, May 27th. Here's the economics. The United States is now part of a world economy. We're more integrated into the world economy than we ever have been as a nation throughout our history. That means we depend for our future, economic future, on how well this economy functions. And that in turn depends more than on anything else, on the quality and the quantity of our labor force, the people who have to do the work. And the single most important institution in developing the skills and training and productivity of our workers is our public education system. That's what educates the vast majority of our students all the way through college and university, since most college and university students attend public institutions. To cut back on the number of teachers, on the quality of the teachers, on the number of days in school, on the number of programs available to students, that those are all ways to undermine our economic future. And all that is in the name of cutting taxes, mostly on business and wealthy folks. Yes, they become richer. Yes, the gap between rich and poor gets worse. But in terms of a strategy for economic development, it's the worst imaginable failure. And the victims, first and foremost, children. Remarkable. The next economic update I want to talk to you about was amazing to me to discover. Here again, let me give you the source. Some of you are interested in pursuing it. Uh, if you go to a place called Market Watch, that's all one word, marketwatch.com, it's a very good source of economic analysis that I make use of from time to time. And this is a story dated March, uh, May 28th, excuse me, May 28th. 2017, by Quentin Fotrell, the personal finance editor. He writes a story that I found astonishing. Maybe you all know about it, but if not, maybe I can astonish you too. Here's the blunt reality. The average U.S. employee who receives a paid vacation as part of his or her job only takes half of it per year. This was the result of a survey of 2,200 workers by the career website Glassdoor, all one word, Glassdoor. And this website, Glassdoor, has been doing these surveys for a few years now, and the number hovers around 50%. 50% of American workers don't take the paid vacation days they have coming to them that are part of their job. Wow. Let's look into this a little bit. The United States is very unusual in advanced industrial countries in not having laws that mandate, that require paid vacations. To give you an idea the United States leaves the question of a paid vacation up to the private sector. Mostly companies have no obligation to keep a person hired. They can fire at will, it's called. And that has to be kept in mind as we go through this story. Only if, you, if the worker can prove discrimination, or if there's a written contract about the job, or if there's a contract with a trade union that covers the job, only then are workers protected. But in most cases, workers keep their jobs 
if and only if the employer wishes them to keep the job. Why is this important? Because this country, again, doesn't require paid vacations at all. There's no law that mandates or requires an employer. In the European Union, in those many countries that have combined in the European Union, workers are legally guaranteed 20 paid vacation days per year. 20 days, folks. That's four weeks. 20 work days. Monday to Friday, four weeks. So let me say it again because I suspect many of you have never heard this or have not pondered what it means. You must, as an employer, whether there's a union or not, or whether there's a written contract or not, you must give every employee a minimum of 20 paid vacation days. In some European countries, it's 25 or even 30 paid vacation days. Americans have no such thing. They're not even close. And it's the law in Europe, not here. And Americans, therefore, depend mostly on the employer. And whatever generosity that employer may or may not have in regard to paid vacations. So Glassdoor and other researchers have begun to ask the American worker, given that you have fewer paid vacation days than other workers, why in the world do you not take half of them? And by the way, a good portion of that paid vacation day that isn't taken is forever lost. Sometimes you can roll it over into the next year. Sometimes you can take compensation of some kind. But in many, many cases, you just lose it, gone, forever. And the answer is, to my mind, sad. Sadder than I can convey. Because the answer, based on a number of questionnaires, and interestingly, the questionnaires were uh, developed by the U.S. Travel Association. And you can see why. Because the more workers don't take their paid vacation, the less travel to a motel or travel to a resort. And the Travel Association is unhappy that workers are not taking their paid vacation because that's their income from workers becoming, at least for a week or two, tourists. Here's this sadness. I'll break down the survey that was done by Glassdoor. 34 percent of respondents to the questionnaire say they don't take all their vacation days because, quote, they fear getting behind on their work. 30 percent believe no one else at the company can do the work while they're away. 22 percent simply answer that they are completely dedicated to their company. It's fear. It's fear that if you are away from your company, even for your paid vacation days, you will somehow jeopardize your job. And since American employers are free to fire in a way that people in other countries are not, this fear is rational. This fear makes sense. But of course, if the employer agreed to pay you for, say, a week that you didn't take, that you went to work, you don't get paid any extra. You would have gotten paid for that week whether you were working or not. You choose to work. You're giving your employer hundreds, and depending on how productive you are, thousands of dollars worth of labor for no extra pay at all. It's a gift. You're making your employer more profitable. And here's the saddest questionnaire result of all. 80% of employees asked said that if they felt fully supported and encouraged by their boss, they would take more time off. Americans don't take half their paid vacation. No one has done the research that I know of to ask what portion of the profits earned by American corporations are attributable to the fact 
that their employees don't take off paid vacation time. It's extraordinary. It means that the level of exploitation of American workers is higher than we already knew it was because of this anxiety, because of the labor reforms that make it possible for an employer to fire you at will, that makes workers so anxious they don't even take the paid vacation that is really part of their pay package. The last short item we'll have time for is again a comment on the so-called free market, this fantasy utopia uh, that has never existed, doesn't exist now, but is something that conservative folks seem to want to believe is there or to want to believe we're on the way there or we're moving there. It, it's sad. It's sad such fantasies govern people's consciousness. Well, how, do, how does that become important right now? In recent years, the United States government has recognized, as have governments around the world, that there are very severe costs to having an energy situation where we rely on oil, coal, and things which, when you burn them, have horrible consequences for our health, for our climate, and so forth. And that, therefore, it's important to look for new and different sources of energy that will not have these bad effects. No rocket science here. And two of the most important have emerged, solar energy from the sun, using the sun's rays, and wind power, using the natural movement of air to generate electricity. Many of you have seen the huge windmills that are now appearing across the countryside around the world. In order to get those new forms of energy up to speed, the government has provided various kinds of subsidies, tax breaks, and so on. Throughout the history of the United States, when things were necessary in the minds of the people who run the country, they would give tax breaks and subsidies. That's how our railroads got built. That's how our canals got built. That's how our, I mean, you name it, that's how it was done. Our computers were invented uh, at universities, subsidized by the United States government to carry out this research. In those days, it was in order to, to fight World War II, but it had all kinds of secondary consequences. So supporting what is important in a society with tax breaks and subsidies is as old as the United States, and it's been done for solar and wind. This, however, not so surprisingly, has made the oil companies and the coal companies upset. And because they are very big and very rich, they know how to translate their political upset into political and economic cash. So they go to work on political parties and politicians and people running for office and promise them big bucks if they will come up with an argument. Any argument will do, as long as it flies, to stop the subsidies and to stop the tax breaks for solar and wind so that we will go back to being reliant on coal and oil. The Koch brothers and many others whose fortunes depend on oil or coal or both are, of course, leading the charge. And now they have two champions. One is Donald Trump, and the other one is Rick Perry, who used to be the governor of Texas, where he hobnobbed with oil companies for obvious reasons, and who's now the energy czar, and he's now being worked on by the oil and coal companies to take away the subsidies and the tax breaks for solar and wind so that we can go back to what they make money on and not help take the country in a new energy direction. The outcome will be whatever the political strength of these two sides are. The companies that want to make their future money on solar and wind one way or another will fight and by politicians and the coal and oil companies. And we all, we the public, the mass, the democratic majority, we will have to live with the health, 
or not health that results from however this fight shapes up the market for energy in this country. Is this a free market? The answer is, you must be kidding. This market is anything but free. It is the playground of massive amounts of bribery, the crude kind, the more sophisticated kind, full of arguments that expensive economists like me have to invent to justify what these two money-making groups are fighting over. We will live with the consequences of what these tiny groups of wealthy capitalists, what they do. Not a way to run a society, wouldn't you say? Okay, we've come to the end of the first half of this program. I want to thank you for being here with me. I want to remind you to make use of those websites, democracyatwork.info and rdwolf with two fs.com. If you're interested in the video version, again, patreon.com slash economic update or YouTube will provide you with the visuals that go with what we do. But most important, partner with us, work with us. Share what you do, share what we do. It's a way to change things for the better. Stay with us. We'll be right back. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. We couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov kids for tips and information. Welcome back, friends, to the second half of Economic Update. Today I am very happy to welcome a person whom I've known for years and who has recently written a book that led me to say, come and join us and give us the benefit of your long life and wonderful stories to tell. So before I introduce her formally, let me welcome Lisa Davis, a friend, to our program. Thank you very much for coming, Lisa. Okay, let me tell you about Lisa E. Davis. She got a PhD in comparative literature some years ago. She taught Hispanic language and literature at the State University of New York in Stony Brook and at York College of the City University of New York. She also collaborated with the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, which is also a part of the City University of New York, and Areito, correct me if I'm wrong about this, a publication of the New York-based Circolo de Cultura Cubana. Uh, her novel, Under the Mink, uh, published in 2001, recreates the 1940s world of mafia-owned village nightclubs that featured drag shows and strip acts. And her recent nonfiction book, and that's the one that caught my eye, is called Undercover Girl, published in 2017. It chronicles the career of a lesbian FBI informant and prosecution witness at the 1949 Smith Act trial of the National Board 
of the Communist Party USA. Okay, Lisa, you're a novelist. You're a specialist in comparative literature. I know you're fluent in, if not all, then many Romance languages. So you have a lot to bring to this. But my first question is about your book. By the way, I want to hold it up so everybody can see it. Undercover Girl, Lisa Davis, subtitle, The Lesbian Informant Who Helped the FBI Bring Down the Communist Party. So here it is, many years later. The, the stuff in this book happens mostly in the late 1940s. Is that yes. Right? yes. 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 Um, and what the book documents is the concerted effort of the United States government, mostly through the FBI, to destroy the Communist Party, a political party functioning in the United States uh, as it had for years, uh, committed to a variety of political objectives, one of which was changing the economic system from capitalism to socialism in one form or another. It destroyed that political party quite effectively, uh, as it turns out. And your book talks about unknown aspects of that process of destruction. So I have to ask you, even before we get into it, why are you now in trance, you as an author, by this story about something that happened long ago? What is it that made you write a book about it? Oh, well, as you can well imagine, I've been entranced for a long time because it takes a, takes a long time to do this kind of thing. Right. However, that it emerges from the mist in 2017 seems terrifically timely because we're facing numerous crises, among them economic, and the roots of all this, of course, lie, lie deep in the past as part of getting rid of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal getting rid of those pesky labor unions that had flourished in the 1930s and 40s, uh, breaking up our partnership with the Russians that had helped defeat the Nazi army, of course. Russia seems to come up in our history periodically. No, yes, yeah, these days too. Because it's a big country and we don't like big countries. We don't know what to do, but you have to deal with them. So it's turned out to be quite timely. Yes. Isn't it? And there's stories that need to, that the young people particularly need, to, need to help them understand what is going on here, if possible, if this helps. Yeah, it helps a great Blessings. deal. Blessings. Let me pick up on one th theme in what you just said. The 1930s was the Great Depression, and the mass of the American people reacted to that depression by mobilizing. They joined the CIO in record numbers. They joined two socialist parties and the Communist Party. And the Communist Party and the two socialist parties and the CIO, the labor union, worked together in most cases to create an enormous, powerful left in America that is largely responsible for putting the pressure on FDR to create the New Deal. There have been people who have said that when the war was over, when the or originator of the New Deal, President Roosevelt, was dead, uh, that the people who hated all that, who had to pay the taxes and who had to see the money that they didn't have anymore be used for Social Security and unemployment benefits and public jobs, they wanted to erase what had happened, to get rid of it, and to make sure it never happened again. And so the argument was they had to break up that powerful alliance of communist, socialist, and labor unions and that they picked as the weak link in there the Communist Party, the one they could go after first and destroy it. Does your research support, undercut, modify the story I just told? Or does it give it strength? H how would you react? As soon as they buried Franklin Roosevelt, they started. Um, they've been trying ever since to get rid of Social Security, as we know, uh, any benefits, the labor unions that were very strong, of course, uh, 
Truman is elected president, Henry Wallace is eliminated mm -hmm. as a progressive uh, communist linked figure. We have to change our attitude toward the Soviet Union from being our ally mm -hmm. during World War II. Mm -hmm. They have to become the bad guys. This is all handled very well through tremendous propaganda campaigns and inculcating fear in the population so that the word communism becomes anathema and probably still is. Recently, the word socialism has crept back into the vocabulary without anyone running away terrified. Um, I don't know if I've covered all the You points. have. So, but that would imply pretty clearly that this political effort of the FBI to destroy the Communist Party was a clearly understood part of this process. Oh, sure. Well, they've been after. Of course, since the Palmer raids in the 1920s, after World War One, world wars always stir things up. World War I stirred things up. Also, we had tremendous immigration, mm -hmm. which is also returning to the vocabulary, tremendous immigration from Europe of people who were accustomed to labor organizations coming out of Europe. Mm -hmm. As we try to separate ourselves once again from the European mm -hmm. phenomenon, Part of the separation is to avoid all those benefits, benefits. that I believe you were speaking mm -hmm. about right. that have been part of European civilization for a long time. We will have no socialism here. From World War I with the Palmer raids and deporting people who were labor organizers out of this country. One of those involved, of course, was J. Edgar Hoover, who mm -hmm. enters the, who enters what was not then called the FBI, but called something that rapidly becomes the FBI. He was the longest serving uh, bureaucrat in the U.S. government from 1924 to 1972. Yeah. He did not intend to step down, resign, or show weakness. In 1939, he sits down with Franklin Roosevelt and doubtless other folks and makes a deal that he can now surveil political enemies as well as criminal elements like all those gangsters that you know uh -huh. you see they will begin to su they will begin surveillance of uh, political enemies like the communist socialist fascist all these are the same thing right and uh, in 42 it picks up a bit more because we're at war in 1940 we have the smith act in parentheses, the Alien Registration Act, which should also begin to sound very familiar to a contemporary public right. to make sure that these people from outside our country who don't understand the American way of life, who are in fact un-American, right. because socialism is un-American. Un so you have all these things coming together as war breaks out in Europe and as war breaks out in the Pacific. But business is very good in wartime because you're making lots of money making all those guns. And employment is fabulous. People who were unemployed for decades, of course you had the WPA also, the Works Project Administration, coming out of the Depression. The government did something. They set up work programs right. to keep people employed. Even artists and writers got a couple of bucks. But um, by, the by that time, by the 1940s, of course, people are getting jobs because they're working for the war effort. And there's a tremendous boom. People are very happy. They're making lots of money. When the war comes to an end, oh, this is not good for business. Not good for business. Tremendous cutbacks, tremendous lots of strikes. People are very unhappy because they're losing their jobs. Yeah. What shall we do? Well, what you have to do is shut them up, basically. And that means coming down on the communist socialist parties and the unions. Oh, yes, particularly, as you can see in this trial, the, commu the, communist, the communists were active in labor union organizing. Yes, I, I get the impression that the communists were chosen because they were the most militant, the most out there, the willing to take the risks of starting a union in a factory, moving, as I know many of them did, to the South and other parts of Midwest, sure. and getting jobs in factory. You know, they were kind of advance 
militants, he would call them in other countries, so that it wouldn't be though so surprising that the FBI would surveil them, but then actively apparently move, and that, let's talk about that, moving to a much more aggressive position where you're not just following them or looking at them or eavesdropping on them, but you're actively mobilizing to destroy them. Tell us a little bit about how that worked in terms of your book and what you found. After the war, they can put them out of business. And the 1949, J. Edgar Hoover had been wanting to do this for a long time. In 1948, they get a subpoena to, uh, for the National Board of the American Communist Party under the Smith Act for the, the accusation is, or whatever they call it in the legal field, not too good in the legal field, except I've read this entire trial, which is a million plus words. Wow. And let me tell you, it's a really strange thing to read. However, uh, they put them on the, the charges conspiracy to advocate the overthrow of the U.S. government by force and violence. I repeat, conspiracy to advocate. To advocate. Uh, the Rosenberg trial was also a conspiracy trial. Conspiracy is good because it probably means you didn't do anything and advocating means you didn't do anything, but you were talking yes. and reading books, yes. which was a no-no. <laughs> and the book, the text that were taught in communist groups, that books they read, and you know, they had little book groups and they talked about what was in the books. These books, the text are read into the transcript of this trial at great length. My particular witness, there are about eight pages of the transcript that go on and on, that the, the prosecution lawyer is reading from something like Lenin's history of something, uh, because if they had a revolution in the Soviet Union, they could have a revolution here. And uh, that's to show how dangerous that notion would be. So if you're reading a book by somebody who was active over there, this Lenin fellow, yeah, yeah. that implied that you might be getting ready to throw a bomb. Overthrow the U.S. government by force, force and, and violence. Yes, yes. Because uh, they got rid of the czar. Amazing that you of. could be accused of a conspiracy to advocate. I always uh -huh. thought growing up in the United States uh -huh. that advocating something was something guaranteed to you by the Constitution. Let, let's continue. Um, you don't want to talk about clear and present danger? No. no oh, all right. Don't. Some uh, other time. Some other time, exactly. Sorry. <laughs> let's go, let's work on this book. Yes. Your, your focus in this book is on a woman who, if I understand you correctly, and please correct me if I, if I remember the details wrong, uh, wrongly. This is a woman who is paid by the FBI for a long period of time, even though my understanding is that that was not revealed and not made public. They found this woman because she has certain, let's call them vulnerabilities, and so she could be induced, I'm trying to be polite, uh, to do something for the money that the Federal Bureau of Investigation gives her. Tell us about this and tell us what, how you understand what happened here. Well, this is, this is the lady in question. This picture is from the Library of Congress collection of the World Telegram. Um, it went out of business in 1963. It was Pulitzer's New York World along with other folks. This is off the front page. You did very well if you were an informant witness. This is sort of what she looked like. There, we did a photo insert for this book that, let me say, cost me years of my young life. And uh, they did not do an index, unfortunately, but I could not fight any longer. Right. Uh, this woman, her name was Angela Calamides, Calamaris, as we say. She was the child of Greek immigrants. They had nothing, of course. They lived on the Lower East Side. And to top it all off, her father dropped dead when she was seven years old. He was brought over to as a scab, basically, for the Fur and Leather Workers Union, which was a strong leftist union, and you very strong. So they needed scabs. You know, the industry needed somebody when they were on strike. But he didn't last too long, Mr. Kalomidis. She was sent to an orphanage in the Bronx. She was forever addled. However, 
uh, not part of her addling, but just generally speaking, she was a lesbian. Uh, they did not, it was not that they recruited her as a punishment or because they could use that against her because they didn't care. Everybody knew she was dating the sister-in-law of her FBI recruiter. Everybody <laughs> knew. And then there's J. Edgar Hoover. And then there's stories about Whitaker Chambers, mm -hmm. if anybody remembers Alger Hiss, that Whitaker was really in love with Alger, and that was the basic problem, which is what Alger Hiss's uh, kid said on, in some conference at NYU years ago. So, you know, it's not quite as simple as, as it would appear. She did it basically for the money. She was in the New York Photo League. She took pictures, taking pictures, as we have noticed also lately in the question of the media, is very important. And uh, they don't want you to take pictures of certain things. So the New York Photo League, which runs from 1936 to 1951 and is shut down by McCarthyism, because they do take pictures of poor people, even poor black people. One of their big projects was something called the Harlem Document, which Angela says in her book would have caused a riot anywhere. Because, uh, of course, one of the main th themes of this book is race in America, which is the theme, of course, in America. That's what it's all about. So I don't know if I answered your question. But anyway, this is Angela. Angela Calamares, and she worked for seven years. How long was she paid from what your research Oh, was? she was paid from the day one, March 1942, she was recruited. I can only do this, and people can only do this sort of thing, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act of 1967, which I'm sure that they regret wholeheartedly. And a lot of the files you get, of course, are full of black marks where they're hiding the good stuff, but there's enough stuff. And people share these. People have shared with me Angela's file, which is, runs from 1942 to the early 60s, and various photographers whose names people would recognize who had extensive FBI files because they took pictures. It's about control. If they could control the people, fine. If they couldn't control them, then they had to find a way to control them. But Angie was fine because they paid her. They started paying her $25 a week. Doesn't sound like much to us, but if you go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics Inflation Calculator, you will find that $25 in today's money is at least 10 to 15 times 25. So she was doing all right. Rents on Christopher Street, she was living in the village, which is where all the girls went. The village really belonged to the gay girls since the suffragettes had been there, many of whom were, of course. Who else has time to do politics because besides single women? Otherwise, you have to look after your husband and the children and the cats and the dogs. So the village belonged to the gay girls much more than the gay men who were uptown somewhere here and there. Uh, that's where they all lived, and that's where Angie lived on Jane Street for years and years and years and years, and she always kept an apartment in the village. Uh, she testified yes. at the trial. Was she a member of the Communist Party? Did she oh, participate? Oh, yes. So she was, yeah. she, was a, she was paid by the FBI oh, yes. to be a member of the Communist Party, and she informed mm -hmm. on them for the years that she did it. Seven. That was all secret, but when, when the trial happens, uh, she testifies against the party. Well, of course. She's undercover. She's undercover. She's a spy for the FBI. She got into the party through nefar nefarious channels. They didn't really want to take her, but, uh, but they did because people helped her out, helped her get in the party. Oh, regret. Oh, regret. When she got up on the witness stand, people just didn't, of course, didn't believe it, of course. Did not believe that this person was sitting there saying these things. She worked undercover for seven years. She testified 1949, about April of 1949, in the middle of the trial. She was the only woman to testify for the prosecution, along with lots of working class guys belonging to the United Auto Workers, mostly. 
because the main target of this trial was really the United Auto Workers, labor unions, and the communist influence there. And you remember Detroit. Right. Well, they were after it for a long time. It took them a long time. Were these white or black auto workers? There were some white guys, but basically black guys. And the whole story about black individuals being recruited or forced into service by the FBI as undercover people in the American Communist Party has yet to be told, but a lot of people have hinted at it, and there are lots of names floating around, and they're the names for this trial. What happened to the, what was the outcome of the trial? For the, the outcome of the trial was everybody, the 11 defendants were convicted, they went to prison for five, federal prison for five years, and they paid a $10,000 fine each. That was $10,000 in 1949 money, multiply that by 10 or 15, and you will find that that was a, hell, a lot of money. Mm. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> that was a lot of money. It bankrupted the Communist Party if you were going to get rid of it. We never outlawed the Communist Party, mainly because the Germans had done it and the Italian fascists had done it, and we didn't want to look like that because we are democratic. <laughs> but they were bankrupted by this, of course. Their leadership was uh, put in prison, that and, was their the money, national board. and their money was taken basically from there. That so, was the national board. So your research demonstrates, in the case of this woman, that the United States government, and you have to assume at the highest levels, understood and pursued the systematic destruction of a political party, financially, in every way, paying informants, not telling the public, since obviously her testimony and that of others would have been handled differently by a jury, one can suppose, if the jury knew that they had been paid for years to do this, that this is a, this is a government that's destroying a political party that is critical of capitalism and that they associate as some agent of a foreign power in the way that today we read the leadership in Turkey or a dozen other countries is doing much the same sort of thing. Is that the conclusion that we draw from this? As J. Edgar Hoover himself said, I, I maintained the Communist Party because I paid the informants who were paying their dues and I kept everything, kept everything going. What they knew up the chain, I'm sure, of course, they knew, but J. Edgar Hoover had all the facts and all the money and all the, you know, they kept very careful records of who was doing what to whom. And when it came time for the trials, there was not only one trial, there were 15 trials all across the country of the leadership of the American Communist Party from Honolulu to Baltimore, from, from Cleveland to Philadelphia, and it basically destroyed, it destroyed the industrial Midwest. If you wonder what happened to the Midwest, this is the beginning of what happened to the Midwest, which is why people can go into the Midwest and promise the return of jobs that are not returning because they went away a long time mm -hmm. ago. And they killed off the communists, then the socialists, and then the unions. If you look at the last 50 years, as soon as they finished with the communists, they went around the country telling people that socialism is more or less the same thing. They just spell it differently. And then there was the unions, which have been in atrophy ever since. It's hard not to come away from reading your book uh, without the, the fearful notion of what a government that decides to destroy a political opposition, what it's able to do and what in this country it has shown its willingness to do. I mean, the constitutional protections were out the window. Many of the civil liberties were out the window. They just went to destroy this organization. Well, it, it's important to say that she perjured herself on the witness stand when she said she was not paid right. because she wanted to look like the great patriot. Right. She was paid. All the other, other witnesses came on the stand and said they weren't paid and they weren't paid. The only one who says he got $60 a week was some nice black guy from... Tennessee or somewhere, who had come north to work in the war industries. Right. And all these people disappeared, of course. Uh, yes, they can do anything they want to. There will be no socialism in America. This is America. There will be no socialism here.
no matter what it takes. No matter what it takes, there will be no socialism here. So and this this is a cautionary tale for people who want to make change now to be aware of what they may be up against. We don't know, of course, what they're using for surveillance these days, whether they still need to hire people. They were sending people into mosques and things, of course, back you know a few years ago. They can probably just plug into your iPhone oh. and see how you're doing, <laughs> you know? Uh, so we don't really know, but we know that we are surveilled constantly. If you don't know that, You're I'm not sorry. paying attention. You're not paying attention. All right, Lisa, we've run out of time. This is very, very important. It's a wonderful look, folks, this book, Undercover Girl, Lisa Davis, at the nitty gritty of how the government works on a day to day with an individual to build up this destruction of a political party, a party that was critical of capitalism. Its old reason to be was about that, and it suffered the consequences. It's hard also for me as an observer who didn't participate not to also fault the party just a touch for having been as naive as I suspect all of us are about what they were up against and what they had to face and what ruthlessness would be deployed against them. You even ha come away sometimes thinking that what the FBI concocted as the horrors of the Communist Party were something they understood real well because they were perpetrating those horrors that they were attributing to others who didn't have the power or the money to, do, to equal it. Thank you very much for coming. And let me say to everybody again, Undercover Girl, a remarkable story about a remarkable page of American history. Thank you all for joining us. We've come to the end of this session of Economic Update. Please remember to Take a look at truthout.org, that remarkable independent source of news and analysis that's been partnering with us for a long time. And please partner with us yourself through the websites and in any way you want. Communicate with us. Find ways that we can work together with you. I look forward to speaking with you again next week.